Welcome to the Cherry Hills Church Podcast. We're in a teaching series called Origin Story, studying the book of Genesis as the foundation of the whole story of the gospel. Thanks for joining us as we learn who God has always been and who we are as part of his story. A reading from Genesis chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from the work of creating that he had done. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. So question for you. Let's begin with a question today. A show of hands. How many of you have said these words lately? Now that spring is here, life is slowing down and I feel like I can rest more. (laughs) Surprisingly, not one hand. In fact, this time of year, our schedule picks up. Soccer games, baseball games, track meets, yard work, family trips. I'm guessing your calendar has something written on it most days of the week. And if you are really organized with extra credit points, it's color-coded. We're busy. Life is busy. And when we're busy, here's what happens. It is easy for God to get pushed to the margins of our lives. It's easy for God to get relegated to our leftover time whenever we might have leftover time. But if our vision here is to give ourselves fully, to go all in, to give ourselves fully to the way of Jesus and his mission, it's nearly impossible to do that without slowing down. So I'm living in this busy spring right now. This past week, I was thinking about this. We we had work and school. We had three track meets with practice every other night. We had a band concert, two doctor's appointments, and two evenings with meetings. And as I was living this, I was reading a book called Practicing the Way by John Mark Comer. And in that book, he writes this. You can see it on the screen. He says, when I offer spiritual direction to people, I often begin by prescribing sleep, margin, time off work, rest. Because chronically exhausted, sleep-deprived, over-busy people are not loving, peaceful, and full of joy. Rest is essential to apprenticeship under Jesus. Rest is essential for followers of Jesus. And so we're in a series called Origin Story, And in this series, we're studying the book of Genesis because if you're following in your notes, Genesis is the origin story of who God is and who we are. And today we're going to look at this rhythm of rest that God gave his people so that whatever season of life we find ourselves in, we can be rooted in our relationship with him. And I was just, I was thinking about this. What if our origin story What if our origin story is not to be overtired, overscheduled, burned out people, but people who live with God in a healthy rhythm of rest and work? I wanna invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, the first page of the Bible. We're in Genesis two today. We've made it through chapter one. We're in Genesis 2. It's either the first or second page of your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, we have black Bibles in the seat rack in front of you. Please pick one of those up and follow along. And if you don't own a Bible, please take one of those home. We want everybody to own a copy of God's Word. God's Word is our authority and light. And so please take one of those home. We mean that. Today, as we pick up at the beginning of chapter 2, The first thing I want to point out is that the chapter and verses were not part of the original writing of the Bible. They were added in the Middle Ages to help people navigate their Bibles and find where they needed to go. And that's important to know today because the three verses we're looking at, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, are the conclusion of the creation story in Genesis 1. 
I wish chapter two began in verse four because that would make a cleaner break. We are looking today at the culmination of the creation story. And I start by saying that because if you're following in your notes, the seventh day, the day of rest is the culmination of creation. It's the high point of creation. The, the, the culmination of creation and the pinnacle of creation was not the sixth day. And then God kicked off his shoes and took a vacation. What we're going to see today is that the seventh day is the purpose of creation. And this is important to name because the seventh day reminds us that we're not the focus of creation in the creation story. Right? We are not the center of the universe. The focus of creation is God and his desire to dwell with people. He is the main character. And what we'll see in these verses is that humanity spends the first day of creation, the first day of their existence, rather, resting in God's Sabbath. And the word in this context, it's important to know because it's not what we imagine as modern English speakers. The word rest is Shabbat, and it doesn't mean to rest as in relaxation. If you're following in your notes, rest, Shabbat, means to cease. To cease. On the seventh day, God ceased creating. He ceased creating. Which leads to another question that we need to answer. Then what did God do after he ceased the work of creation? To answer that, we need to look at another important Hebrew word used to talk about the meaning of Sabbath and God's rest. It's found in the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. You can see this on the screen. It says, for in six days... The Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested, Nuach, on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So if you're following in your notes, in Exodus 20, the, the word Nuach means setting in, settling in. It's a word that implies new activities are beginning. Let me give you an example so that we have an imagination for what this means. This example is given by author John Walton. He writes this. You can see this quote on the screen. He says, In the first six days of creation, everything is installed in their appropriate position and given their appropriate roles. Using the company analogy, they are assigned their offices, told to whom they will report, and thus given an idea of their place in the company. Their workday is determined by the clock, and they are expected to be productive. Foremen have been put in place, and the plant is now ready for operation. But before the company is ready to operate, the owner is going to arrive and move into his office. <laughs> that is so good. That is so good. So what did God do after he ceased the work of creation? If you're following in your notes, God finished creating and he settled in to take his rightful place as the ruler of everything he created. He settled in. The seventh day was God's enthronement over all creation. The king was now in his temple in the Garden of Eden. The seventh day is the culmination of all creation, and it is what God created the world to be. And he invited humanity into that rest to dwell with him in perfection, to represent him, to be his image bearers, to be fruitful and multiply, to rule the animals, to cultivate the garden, and to be co-creators with him. After God ceased creating he settled in. God took up his rest and he ruled from his residence. And it's fascinating to see what the first thing he does as he settled in. If we look at verse three, we see the first thing God did as he began to rule over the world he created, he blessed the seventh day and made it holy. The seventh day is set apart in the creation story because again, it's the culmination of creation. It's the only day mentioned three times in the creation story, and repetition conveys significance. 
And it's the only day that God blesses and makes holy. And by blessing the seventh day, God extends his favor to it and he sets it apart. In fact, if you're following in your notes, holy means set apart. It means set apart. God set apart this seventh day to be different from every other day. And by setting the day apart, God created a rhythm of work and rest. This was God's design and desire for creation. This rhythm was so important to God that he included it in the Ten Commandments. God gave the Ten Commandments to his people to show them what it looks like to bear his image. He, he told the people what a redeemed people look like and what they live like. God didn't give his people the Ten Commandments so they could earn salvation and earn a relationship with him. The people already had a relationship with him. He's giving them a way to be image bearers and to dwell with him. And so the Ten Commandments are actually given to us in two places in the Bible, in Exodus, the second book, and Deuteronomy, the fifth book. We'll look at Exodus first. Genesis, the first book, ends with God's people moving to Egypt to survive a famine. And while they're in Egypt, they become slaves of Pharaoh for 400 years. Exodus literally means exit, and it's about God leading his people out of slavery. Moses leads God's people out of Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. They arrive at a mountain called Mount Sinai. And on this mountain, God gives his people the Ten Commandments. I mean, I want you to think about this. Let's put ourselves in their position. They had lived in a land with false gods and idols, and God begins by saying to the people in the Ten Commandments, no other gods, no idols, honor my name, and then he tells them to rest. He tells them to rest. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 20 to look at the command again, this time in its entirety. I'll read verses 8 to 10 and then invite you to read verse 11 in the first gray box on your notes. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. And then would you read this with me in the first gray box or on the screen? It says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. That sounds a lot like Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. God's people are to remember creation and their creator. They are to take one 24-hour period of time and delight and worship and remember God, their creator. If you're following in your notes, Sabbath is an invitation to observe the pattern of work and rest in creation. It's an invitation to observe this pattern. This is one way we bear God's image. We model this rhythm, and in doing so, we're reminded that God is in control, that he has settled in to rule his creation, and he is still ruling. Sabbath reminds us we can take a day off, and the world will keep spinning. It reminds us that we cannot check our email or social media and our company will still exist the next day. It is good to be reminded that all of our hope, all of our trust, all of our dependence is on God and he is in control. And Sabbath allows us to slow down to remember that. It is good to remember that it is not our responsibility to hold everything together that is too great of a burden to bear. And that's why if you're following in your notes, Sabbath is an invitation to trust that God has settled in. We trust he is in control of all things. This is good to remember. Exodus 20 is the first place in the Bible the Ten Commandments are given. And then 40 years later, God's people are about to enter the promised land, the land God promised to Abram. And the people who had heard the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, they grumbled and they complained. They did not trust God. 
And as a consequence for their disobedience, an 11-day trip from Egypt to the Promised Land turned into 40 years wandering around the desert until almost everyone who was rescued from Egypt had died and a new generation had risen up. So Exodus 20 is written to the first generation of God's people out of slavery. Deuteronomy is written to that generation's children who are about ready to step into the Promised Land. Deuteronomy is essentially a sermon to a new generation that was not part of the Exodus. And Moses retells the highlights of God's story, and as part of those highlights, he gives the Ten Commandments again. I'll read Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 to 14, and then ask you to join me again in verse 15. Deuteronomy says, Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. And then would you read this with me, verse 15, second gray box, or on the screen it says... Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath. A couple things to notice that are different between Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. First, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, the people are told to remember the Sabbath. And in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12, the word is changed to observe. In Hebrew, the word for observe means to keep, to watch, to guard over, to protect. It's the word used in Genesis chapter 2.15 when Adam is put in the garden and told to tend the garden and keep it and watch it and protect it. And then the big change, and you might have noticed this, it's what we read together In Exodus, the motivation for Sabbath is creation. Remember the creation. In Deuteronomy, the motivation is freedom. Right, the command in Exodus was about imitation. Imitate the rhythm used to create the world. In Deuteronomy, the motivation is liberation. You are a free people. Remember, you were slaves, but that's not who you are anymore. The parents and grandparents of the people listening to Moses in this moment had one identity in Egypt, and it was to work. It was the job of slaves to work. Their very existence was predicated on their ability to work. So this command to Deuteronomy teaches us, if you're following in your notes, that Sabbath is an invitation to remember our identity, who we are. A.J. Swoboda, a pastor in Oregon, says this. You can see this quote on the screen. He says, Sabbath is a scheduled weekly reminder. And then this sentence is beautiful. That we are not what we do. Rather, we are who we are loved by. Sabbath and the gospel scream the same thing. We do not work to get to a place where we finally get to breathe and rest. That's slavery. Rather, we rest and breathe and enjoy, God, that we might enter into rest. Practicing Sabbath teaches us that we are more than what we do, that our first identity is that we are created in the image of God to dwell with him. Friends, what if our paradigm of work could be shifted from working, 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 and then crashing into rest And instead, we work from a place of rest. I mean, that paradigm shift alone could be life-changing and life-giving for us. And one more thing about Sabbath and identity. No other culture in the ancient world celebrated a weekly day of rest. No other society in ancient times took a day off because survival was often a day-to-day affair. But God commanded his people to take a Sabbath because he wanted to remind them that he would provide for them. They could trust him. He was in control. He had settled in. And as they trusted him, they would be set apart and they would not look like the culture around them. 
And if you're following in your notes, that is why Sabbath is an invitation to be set apart from the culture. It is a way to be set apart from the culture around us. What if, like what if God gave us a way of standing out as followers of Jesus in our culture? What if he gave us a gift that was good for us and allowed us to be set apart to a watching world? Wouldn't it be like God to give us something like that? We have that gift in the Sabbath. John Tyson, a pastor in New York City, wrote these words. Jesus is not glorified or seen as beautiful or desirable if his followers are exhausted or stressed and worn out in the exact same way as the world. A restful spirit is spiritual warfare in a culture of exhaustion. When we practice Sabbath, we are fighting the powers and principalities of this world. It is a counter-cultural way of living. Who knew naps could be so powerful? (laughs) It is essential to rest if we want to become more like Jesus. But I want to be clear about something. We need to know this. We no longer live under the old covenant. We're a people of the new covenant. We don't live under law, we live under grace. So that means as we continue into the New Testament, there's not a command requiring us to practice Sabbath. Jesus fulfilled the requirements of the law for us so that we no longer need to observe specific laws like sacrifices or practicing Sabbath. So listen, you're not sinning like those in the Old Testament if you don't observe the Sabbath. It just isn't wise. I've found that if I want to become more like Jesus, if I want to experience more of the presence of God in my life, if I want to demonstrate, if I want to possess and demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit in my life, if I want my life to be marked by more love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, then I need to slow down. I'm not at my best, and I'm just guessing you're not either. I'm not at my best, and I don't represent Jesus well when I am tired, over busy, and burned out. So in the New Testament, Sabbath is not a command we have to observe. It's an invitation and a gift that we get to practice. Jesus even affirmed this. When the religious leaders turn the Sabbath into a to-do list rather than a time to stop and rest and delight and remember Jesus said to them in Mark chapter 2 verse 27 the sabbath was made for man not man for the sabbath Jesus was saying that sabbath was made for us because it's an invitation and a gift to rest if you're following in your notes sabbath is an invitation to rest in Jesus to rest in Jesus one of my favorite verses in scripture is Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. These are the words of Jesus. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus offers us rest. He offers us himself. And when seen as a gift, Sabbath allows us to slow down and dwell with God. It allows us to slow down, to remember our creator and to trust that he is in control. It is a gift that allows us to remember our identity and to be set apart from the culture. Sabbath is a gift that points us to Jesus. And I want to pause here for just a moment because you may be thinking, okay, this might be something I want to look into a little bit more, or this might be something I I want to try, but I have no idea how to do this. And so I want to talk about this for just a few minutes practically before we get back to Genesis and wrap up. I want to invite you to turn your notes over. And one resource I want to give you, and don't click on it now or text now, but we wanted to provide you with a resource to our Sabbath guide that our creative team put together several years ago. 
Most of what I'm going to talk about in the next couple minutes are from that guide and from Chuck's Spiritual Formation Institute class. If you're interested in going deeper into spiritual practices like Sabbath, Chuck will be offering that class again this fall. Sarah and I took that class last fall. It was terrific. It was so helpful to learn more about these practices that form us. But first, some ideas to practice the Sabbath. First, although 24 hours is highly recommended, if you can't do that, start where you are. Start where you are. This is terrible English. I just say it up front. Don't not practice Sabbath because you can't do 24 hours, right? The the worst thing you can do is opt out because you're not perfect at it. Start where you are. What amount of time can you set apart that looks different from the other six days of the week? Maybe it's just a family meal and an evening together. Maybe it's come to church on Sunday and spend some afternoon time reading. If it makes you tired thinking about adding a day of rest to your schedule, start where you are. Start where you are and put it on your calendar. Number two, put it on your calendar. I used to think that scheduling spiritual practices was somehow less holy or it counted less, but I've changed my mind on that. We schedule most things that are important to us. So if you look at my phone every day, you will see scheduled time with Jesus in the morning in word and prayer. And on our calendar in the kitchen, we have Sabbath written on every Saturday of the month. Put it on the calendar. If it's not on your calendar, it probably won't happen. Number three, establish an official beginning and ending. Super easy. Maybe it's just a prayer of God, thank you that we can sit down and rest together. Maybe light a candle. Our family has a Sabbath candle on the table that we only light once a week when we practice Sabbath. And there are some weeks it doesn't get lit because we are just too busy and we don't practice. If you want to do this, the fourth thing you need to think about is preparing and planning for it. What do you need to do ahead of time so this day looks different? Can you do your laundry a different day of the week? Can you go to the store a different day of the week? Can you do your dishes another day of the week? Can you vacuum on another day of the week? Parents, young parents, I'm not talking about not changing your baby's diaper on Sabbath. (laughs) Sorry, little John, uh, it's Sabbath. But what can you do to set this day apart that looks different? One thing our family does. Number five, we eat special food. Most weeks our family makes homemade pizza, And once in a while, if they're on sale, we'll buy some steaks for a treat and we'll have that for a Sabbath meal. We prefer staying at home, but it is perfectly legal to go out and eat. Make a good dessert. Make it with the kids. Eat special food that marks the Sabbath. It doesn't have to be fancy. Just do something that marks the time. Games and movies are legal. Right? What games do you enjoy playing as a family? What card games or board games? What, what movies might you enjoy watching together? Seven, speak life-giving words. Chuck is big on this, and I so appreciate it. Speak encouraging words over one another. How do you see God at work in that person's life? Share highs and lows from the week. Read scripture and talk about it with each other. Number eight, make a plan for technology. What are you gonna do with your phones during this time? You're gonna put them in a box or put them in a room or put them in a drawer or turn them off or turn off notifications. What can you do so the ding doesn't happen and a dopamine hit goes to your brain and you gotta go find out how needed you are? What are you gonna do with technology during this time? Because I I want to recommend that Sabbathing, Sabbathing a word, I just made that up. (laughs) Taking a Sabbath from technology is important as well because we live our lives glued to our phones. And number nine, invite good friends. Don't be afraid to practice Sabbath together. In the Bible, Sabbath was a community event. So you can practice Sabbath with others. But here's what I hope that list does for you. Rather than thinking about Sabbath, we we have a really small picture sometimes that Sabbath becomes a list of do's and don'ts. And I want to encourage you to think of it as a wide open field in which to play where you can stop working, rest, do what you delight in, and remember God. 
And whatever you decide to do or not do, I want to recommend these four characteristics are included. They're, under, they're at the bottom of that back page of your notes. The first is stop. Sabbath means to cease. We stop from our everyday work. This day looks different. We rest. You've got to figure out what's restful for you because what's restful for you may not be restful for me. What brings you rest? What do you delight in? Make sure delight is part of your Sabbath. What do you enjoy doing? You need to figure that out. What brings you joy? Because I'll tell you last night, as we practiced Sabbath, I put on my Illini shirt. Sarah put on her Illini shirt. Daniel put on his Damascus jersey. And we delighted in watching Illinois make the Sweet 16 for the first time in 19 years. <laughs> that was a good Sabbath. What do you delight in? What brings you joy? Some of us can't answer that question. And then we remember we, we remember and intentionally spend time with God, remembering who he is and who we are, whether it's scripture or prayer or a worship service or listening to worship music. This is why I believe for most of us, Sunday is probably the best day to practice Sabbath because there's a built-in remembering that happens when we gather. How does it start on Saturday night and go through church or starts on Sunday morning, you come to church together and then you rest the rest of the day. We stop. We rest, we delight, and we remember. Now, let's go back to Genesis 2 in the final couple minutes as we wrap up. I want to pull up from this invitation to a 24-hour Sabbath rest each week to get an even bigger picture of Sabbath and the gift and invitation that we're invited into. If you look in your Bibles at the end of the creation story in Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, there is no concluding formula like there is on the first six days of creation. You do not see there was evening and there was morning. That's intentional. That's intentional. Because theologically and spiritually, the seventh day has never ended. The seventh day opens out into the ongoing story of God with his people. The culmination of all creation was God entering his rest to settle in and rule and reign over his creation and to dwell with his people. So Sabbath is not just a 24-hour rest we are invited into. If you're following in your notes, Sabbath is an invitation to God's rest, a present reality, and a future hope. It's a present reality and a future hope. In the New Testament book of Hebrews, the author of the letter says in chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, you can see this on the screen, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works just as God did from his. There is an eternal Sabbath rest waiting for those who follow Jesus. An eternal Sabbath rest where we are forgiven of sin, where we dwell with God and we settle into a recreated world where God will rule and reign and we will be with him. The recreated world is a return to the seventh day of creation. What an incredible gift and invitation we've been given in Sabbath. So two questions as we close, two questions. First, have you entered his Sabbath rest? Have you trusted in what Jesus accomplished on the cross and that you don't have to work to be accepted by God? You don't have to try harder. You just need to accept the gift Jesus offers and say, thank you. Today can be the day you accept that invitation of forgiveness and eternal life. Have you entered his Sabbath rest? And then the second question, have you accepted the invitation and gift of weekly Sabbath? Have you accepted this invitation? Are you willing to rearrange your schedule to intentionally set apart time to dwell with God? 
Because if you're willing to do this, I think you might be surprised what a gift it is. This week would be a great opportunity to practice Sabbath. On Friday, Luke already said this, we're having our Good Friday services at five and seven. If you've never been, I wanna encourage you to attend. They are, it is an amazing, sacred service. Maybe start by attending those services and then have dinner with family or friends with no technology. Stop and rest and delight and remember what Jesus did for you and that we will gather three days later to celebrate his victory. But have you accepted the invitation and gift of a weekly Sabbath? As we close today, I wanted to give us some space to exhale and rest, maybe just a, a miniature Sabbath here as we gather. I'm gonna put Matthew 11, 28 to 30 on the screen once again. And I wanna let you read that verse several times to yourself and then spend a couple minutes answering the question, what is God inviting me into? I'm trusting God is always at work and his Holy Spirit is speaking to us even right now. So as you read those verses, would you just ask God, God, what, what is your invitation for me today? What's your invitation for me today? And then we'll close in prayer and communion. God, thank you for the invitation and gift of Sabbath. God, would, would you continue speaking to us? Would you make it clear how we can stop and rest and delight and remember? How we can dwell with you? And God, as, as I heard the joyful noise of that little baby in this room, I pray for young parents. It is so hard. It's so hard to find time to rest but I pray you would give them the desire and the discipline to slow down, to be with you. God, thank you that you have given us an eternal Sabbath, that one day when you come back to make all things new, we will dwell with you and we will see you face to face. God, we are grateful for the gifts you give us. God, thank you so much. We love you. It's in Jesus' saving name we pray. And everybody agreed and said, amen. Thank you for listening to this week's teaching. If you'd like more info on our church, you can visit our website or find us on Facebook.